Hi, I'm Philipp Kindermann, and this is my Eurowiz talk about cluster sets. This was joint work with Jakob Geiger, Sabine Kornelsen, Jan-Henrik Haunert, Tamara Metschett-Lietze, Martin Nöllenburg, Yoshio Okamoto, and Alexander Wolf. In this talk, we want to explore different ways to visualize categorical point data such that close points are clustered. Imagine you have a map, for example, of Manhattan here, and there are a bunch of points of interest that you want to visualize. For example, you're interested in subway stations, in hotels, and in hospitals. This gives us different sets of points, and these sets we want to visualize while keeping the spatial locations. There are already a few algorithms that do that. For example, bubble sets, where every set looks like soap bubbles, or line sets, where we have a simple line through all the points of the same category. Then there is kelp fusion, where we represent the sets by trees, but if we have empty regions, then we might use a polygon here. And map sets, where the whole map is split into colored regions that may only contain points of the corresponding color. In all of these approaches, the points of the same category are always completely connected. In this talk, we want to relax this connectivity requirement to preserve the locality of clusters. And that might give us a visualization like this one, where we don't have a single green region, but two green regions, four blue regions, and three red regions. The design goals of our approach are the following. We want the categories to be represented by distinct colors. We want to form clusters, which are subsets of points from the same category. And these clusters should form distinct regions in the plane. For these clusters, we want that the points inside a cluster are sufficiently close, and we want to have a small number of clusters per category. The question is, what do we mean with sufficiently close? For example, these two green points are in the same cluster, but are further away from each other than these two red, which are not in the same cluster. However, if we have denser parts of the map, then we don't want to have the same metric that decides which points are close than if we have not so dense parts. So instead of looking at the Euclidean distance, we use a suitable proximity graph to define which points are close. We propose the following pipeline for an algorithm. First, we want to pick a proximity graph. There are several established uh, algorithms that can do that. For example, the Delaunay triangulation. In a Delaunay triangulation, we have a triangle between three points if and only if the circle through these three points contains no other point in its interior. In the Gabriel graph, we have an edge between two vertices if the circle that has the connection between them as a diagonal does not contain any other point. So we also have this edge here, but not this up here. And a better skeleton is a generalization of this. Here we don't use circles, but we can narrow them or make them wider. And this might give us even a non-planar graph. If we choose beta to 1, then these objects are exactly circles, so we get the Gabriel graph. If we set beta to 0, then they are just segments, and we get the complete graph. In the second step, when we have the proximity graph, we want to find a planar spanning forest in it. So for this example, if these points are red and these are green, then this would be a planar spanning forest. In the third step, we want to augment the spanning forest. So between vertices that are in the same component, we can add more edges to make it a bit more dense. And finally, after we've done that, we want to render our solution. For that, there are again different approaches. For example, we can use the line Voronoi diagram, which is what we used in this example here. Or we can simply display a planar sparing forest that we computed in step two, like here. Or a third approach is to take what we have after step three and try to draw empty polygons around these edges. 
Let's have a look at a smaller example. We have three sets of points here. First we create a proximity graph with a beta skeleton with low beta. And then we can already remove all these edges that are not monochromatic because we don't need them anymore. Now we find a planar spanning forest. And in step 3 add back all the edges we can inside the same cluster. And now we use the polygon representation to render the solution. Algorithmically, the most interesting step is step 2. So we now want to focus on this step. We developed two heuristic algorithms. In both of them, we want to pick edges from our graph and move it to a second graph G prime, such that in G prime, in the end, we have a planar spanning forest. And in all algorithms, we remove all the bichromatic edges from the input here. In the greedy algorithm, we do three steps. First, we remove all edges from G that are in the same component here. In the beginning, that's nothing. Then, we take an edge here that is crossed by a minimum number of edges. So, for example, this planar edge here and move it over there. And then we remove all edges from G that used to cross this. So as long as we have planar edges here, we don't have to do step 3. But now these two vertices are in the same component here, so we have to remove this edge. We can keep planar edges, move them over, repeat steps 1 and 2. And by step 1, it might even happen that another edge becomes planar that we can also move. At some point, there will be no planar edges left, so we have to pick one that has minimum number of crossings. For example, this one here, move it to G prime, and now remove this edge that used to cross it. In the final step, we have to pick another edge between the red ones, because they are only crossed twice, while the blue edges are crossed three times, move it to G prime, remove the remaining edges, and we're done. The second heuristic is the so-called reverse greedy. In the beginning, these two algorithms do exactly the same. We remove edges between the same component and we move all non-crossed edges to G prime. So let's do that. But at some point, when we only have crossed edges here, instead of picking the edge with the fewest number of crossings, we remove the edge with the largest number of crossings. For example, this one here. Now we again have planar edges that we can move. We have to find the edge with the largest number of crossings, remove it. This has the largest number of crossings, remove it, and add planar edges to G prime. And then again we get a solution. We will later evaluate that both these heuristics give us very good solutions in practice. But in theory they can be quite bad. So let's have a look at some examples. Let's say we have a blue star with K leaves. And we have a red star with k minus 2 leaves, where the leaves are connected by a path. And we have three green vertices that also intersect the blue edges. What would the greedy algorithm do here? It first picks all the planar edges, and then it picks a green edge because it has the fewest number of crossings. Then it removes all the edges that crossed it, and now it might pick the other green or one of the red edges, it doesn't matter, we get the same solution, which has k plus 1 blue clusters, 1 green and 1 red. On the other hand, the reverse greedy performs very well here. It again picks this path, but now it successively removes all the red edges because they have the largest number of crossings. Then it removes the green edges, and finally it can pick all the blue edges, which gives us one cluster for blue, three for green, and only two for red. On the other hand, if we slightly adjust this example and move this path from here to here, then it's the other way around. Now the greedy first picks the planar edges, then it picks a green edge, then it picks another green edge, and it can pick all of the red edges. And we get in total three clusters. The reverse greedy, on the other hand, at first picks the planar edges, and then it starts removing those red edges. Then it removes one green edge, and can pick one blue for it. And finally it can pick the other green edge. So now we have one blue cluster, two green, but k minus one red. 
So there are examples where greedy is arbitrarily worse than reverse greedy and examples where reverse greedy is arbitrarily worse than greedy. So for this problem we develop the greedy and the reverse greedy heuristic and then we also developed an IDP formulation that can solve it exactly but is quite slow. In general this problem is MP hard even when all the points are in the same category which was proven by Janssen and Böginger in 1993. Let's go back to our pipeline. We now want to have a closer look at the first step, proximity graphs. We have these three different ways to create a proximity graph. And actually the Gabriel graph is a subgraph of the Delaunay triangulation. Now the Delaunay triangulation is or known to be planar. Now the whole second step, finding a planar spanning forest is trivial as long as the graph is planar. So these don't give us very interesting future steps. Now as long as the graph is planar, the monochromatic edges in the proximity graph already give us clusters that cannot be extended. So it doesn't make sense to compare our heuristics on planar graphs. Instead we focused on beta skeletons. And now I briefly want to show you an example on the influence that beta has on the solution. Here we can see, for beta equals zero, we get a very small number of clusters, but we also have connection between vertices that are not really close. While for beta equals one, we get many clusters and most of the points are singletons, which comes from the fact that this is the Gabriel graph, which is planar. Instead, choosing something in the middle seems to be the better choice. We conducted a case study for our algorithm on three datasets all of which you have already seen in this talk. The first set contains 78 points that represent the facilities of University of Bonn, where the categories are the departments. This is the data you saw on the title slide. And the left example was a simple Voronoi diagram that we used for those colored points, while the right example used our greedy algorithm on a 0.5 skeleton and shows both the line Voronoi diagram and the polygon representation. And here we can see, although most of the yellow and brown facilities are close to the main campus, they are still split into different regions, while in our approach they form one contiguous one. Also, these two purple points, although they are close with nothing in between, are in different regions, while our approach puts them together into the same one. The second data set is from Manhattan and has been used as benchmarks before. That's the one that you saw on the first slides. Here, if we compare the different styles from the literature, we can see that the bubble sets, line sets and kelp fusion have many crossings between their sets, they might be at very small angles and they might even be very close to other facilities. While in the map sets we don't have crossings, but those polygonal shapes can be very complex. For our representations, the tree representation is quite similar to the kelp fusion and line sets and also the bubble sets, where we don't really see the clusters very well since everything is just connected by lines. However, in the polygon and in the line Voronoi representation, we can clearly make out the clusters. And in this example, the line Voronoi representation seems to work particularly well, because the points are almost evenly separated throughout the map. On the other hand, in other maps, where we might have large empty regions like here, the polygon representation seems to work better. The third dataset we extracted from OpenStreetMap and it has 16,320 points and 123 different categories. This is almost the same spatial extent as the first dataset from University of Bonn, but of course it has many more points of interest. A smaller part of this dataset we already saw here. And now we want to experimentally look at the number of clusters we get depending on beta where green is the optimum solution, red is the greedy, and blue is the reverse greedy algorithm. We can see that the greedy is slightly better than reverse greedy, but both are very similar to the ILP solution. Also, we can see that in the beginning we have some drastic changes, and in the end we have some even more drastic changes, while in the middle, around 0.4 to 0.7, not really much changes. 
And since the number of flusters don't seem to change too much somewhere in the middle here, this seems to be a good trade-off between our design goals that we want few clusters, but vertices still to be close within the cluster. Based on this dataset, we also conducted quantitative experiments on the running time and the quality of our solutions. To create smaller data from this large dataset, we took the region that the data lies in and split it into nine squares. For each square, we took the center point, and for different ends from 50 to 250, we found the closest points to the centers. This gives us 9 times 5, so 45 different datasets. And for each dataset, we ran experiments for beta equals 0.5 to 0.9 in steps of 0.05. You can also download the code we used for these experiments from GitHub. First, we want to briefly talk about the running time. For all of these instances, both the greedy and the reverse greedy algorithm always could find solutions in less than 50 milliseconds. The ILP worked well for instances of 50 points, where we got solutions within 11 seconds, but even for 100 points, it required up to 1.8 hours, and for 150 points, there were some instances where we stopped the solver after two days. So we only have optimal solution for some of the instances with 150 points, and for none of those with 200 and 250. I will now briefly show the results for better equals 0.5. You can find the others in the supplementary material. We use whiskers plots, where the middle edge is the median, and the top and bottom boundary of the rectangles are the 75 and 25 percentiles. We can see here that for small examples, where both heuristics perform very close to the ILP, and while for larger number of points it gets a bit further away, the difference between the median is still at most 5 clusters here. Also both heuristics seem to perform equally well. This is also the case for those instances the ILP could not solve, and for larger instances. In fact, of all the instances we had here, only 66 times the greedy heuristic was better, 126 times the reverse greedy algorithm was better, and 213 times they got the same number of clusters. And as further evidence that our algorithms perform very close to the optimum, we are also plotted for every beta and the instances the ILP could solve, how many more clusters or heuristics needed in the worst case. And we can see here that only few data points have more than 10% more clusters than the optimum. Let's conclude. We developed the pipeline for the cluster sets method. We developed heuristics to solve step 2, and we mostly focused on beta skeletons in step 1. For step 4, we considered three different options, where we prefer the line Voronoi and the polygon representation. We did not yet talk about step 3. Here so far we only add edges back in arbitrary order without creating crossings. But one could further investigate if there are better algorithms here. Also, all our points have one single category, and it would be interesting if these algorithms can be adjusted when we have more than one category per point. Thank you for watching.